Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. In this place, God is worthy to be praised. He's a mighty God. We're all gathering in. We're, we're coming in. It's been a long day, been a long week, a lot, lot of stuff going on. But I know that God never changes. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The same God of power that we felt in this place on Sunday. He's the same God of power today, tonight, in this place on a Wednesday night. I want to read to you from the book of Matthew, chapter 10, beginning at verse number 27. Jesus says, what I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. And what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Now hear these verses. Are not two, are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? Sparrows aren't worth much. And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. That is, without your father knowing about it. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Tonight, church, I, we, we got a reason to praise and worship. We got a reason to be happy tonight because God knows us. God sees us and God knows us tonight. And that's something, maybe we're not running, dancing, swinging from the chandeliers, but I'm telling you, there's a revelation. If we ever get the understanding, God really sees me where I'm at. And God really knows everything about me. And not only that, but he's concerned about me. And he cares about me. And he loves me. That'll put faith in you. That's a reason to worship and praise the Lord tonight as our worship team comes. In Jesus' name. That we can, who is thankful that we have a God that we can call on his name and we can, and that he will hear us and that he will answer our cry. Before I start this song, um, the bridge, it, this is one of my favorite songs. The bridge says, God is fighting for us, pushing back the darkness, lighting up the kingdom that cannot be shaken in the name of Jesus. The enemy is defeated, and I will shout it out. What I love about this is when you read it, it says he's not just fighting for us, but he's pushing back the darkness. There is a, darkness is not just a thing. It's a spirit that comes into us, whether it be a darkness in just the situations of life, in our minds, spirit of depression, suicide, whatever it may be. That is a spirit of darkness that enters in. And I love it because it says that he's fighting for us. That means he goes before us. He's fighting in front of us. But he's pushing back the darkness before it ever gets to us. Not he's pushing out the darkness. He's pushing back the darkness. So as we sing, keep that in mind. Remember as we're singing that he is fighting for us. He's walking with us. And that because of that, we have freedom. Alive in me 
for us. God is on our side. He has overcome. Yes, he has overcome. We will not be shaken. We will not be moved. Jesus, you are here. Carrying our burdens, covering our shame. He has overcome. Yes, he has overcome. We will not be shaken. We will not be moved. Jesus, you are here. Shout it out, shout it out. God is fighting for us, pushing back the darkness, lighting up the kingdom that cannot be shaken. In the name of Jesus, enemies defeated. And we will shout it out, shout it out. God is fighting for us, pushing back the darkness, lighting up the kingdom that cannot be shaken. In the name of Jesus, enemies defeated, and we will shout it out, shout it out. God is fighting for us, pushing back the darkness, lighting up the kingdom that cannot be shaken. In the name of Jesus, enemies defeated, and we will shout it out, shout it out. I will live, I will not die. The rest Jesus, enemies defeated, and we will shout it out, shout it out. God is fighting for us, pushing back the darkness, lighting up the kingdom that cannot be shaken. In the name of Jesus, enemies defeated, and we will shout it out, shout it out. God is fighting for us, pushing back the darkness, lighting up the kingdom that cannot be shaken. In the name of Jesus, enemies defeated, and we will shout it out, shout it out. Just go ahead and lift him up for a minute. Go ahead and magnify him. Oh, we lift you up, Jesus. We praise your holy name. We exalt your name, oh Lord. I magnify you, Lord God. All of my heart, soul, mind, and strength, oh God. I give glory and honor and praise unto your name. You alone are righteous, you holy, oh God. Oh, Lord, let your glory sweep the house tonight. Let your spirit, oh God, move from front to back in this building right now. Nothing but you, oh Lord, all praise and glory and honor be unto your name. Oh, we lift you up, Jesus. We praise your holy name, oh Lord. Hallelujah. 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 We lift you up, Jesus. Oh, Lord, we magnify your name. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Lord, push back the darkness. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. One more time, just lift your hands, your heart, your voices. You, O oh Lord, are righteous and holy. Hallelujah. Just go ahead and continue to lift him up across the building right now. That's it, just let the Holy Ghost sweep through the building, front to back, side to side, all the way back to the soundboard. Oh, Lord of heaven. Lord, you've entered into this house. Lord, you've met us in this sanctuary. Lord, this is the same spirit that was here on Sunday. Lord, breathe upon us tonight. The holy fire of heaven. Let renewal come. Let strength come. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. What a powerful presence of the Lord is here tonight. The same spirit moved through this house on Sunday. We rejoice tonight. The Lord is doing exactly what he promised us he would do. Uh, working, confirming his word with signs following. The Lord has spoken to us, promised us harvest, told us the harvest was in the field, get our hands in the field, get involved. We've been reaching, we've been stretching. We've talked about people getting the Holy Ghost, backsliders coming home, that happening outside the walls of the church. We want to rejoice tonight. Sunday afternoon after we had had service and our luncheon and Everything's over. Bible says give thanks in all things. I'm not, I'm not going to miss one moment to let the devil know that God fulfills his word and God is in control. <laughs> Service was over. Stuff was cleaned up. We were at the end of the day. Brother Jason was going around making sure everything was locked up tight. I went back to the back because my wife's car was parked there and I knew she had to go out the gate and so I let her go out the gate. I'd already come out to my truck, was going to leave and then I was like, you know what, hey, good husband would take care of that sort of thing. So I went back, she went out the gate, shut the gate, locked the gate. I'm tired now, Sunday's almost over. I'm lazy now. I don't come back through the building. I take the shortcut because I want to get to my truck as quick as I can. I open the door of my truck. I step on the running board and start stepping in, and a car pulls in beside my truck. And I'm just kind of glancing because I don't, you know, I run with a rough crowd. I don't know who's coming. And as I'm starting to get in the truck, I hear, Brother Hill. I'm like, because, I mean, this is, this is a sleek sedan with blacked out windows, and it's like, okay, I'm, I'm not sure about this. And out of that car comes two gentlemen. Now I know I'm in trouble. And one begins to talk to me, and he says, you don't remember me, do you? That's always a bad question. Long story short. He says, I'm Reuben. I was here when you preached revival here years ago. He, then he takes off his prescription glasses. I thought he just had on sunglasses. There is prescription glasses. But he takes them off, basically says, get a good look at my mug. And I said, okay, yeah, I, 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 I'm remembering. And he begins to talk. He says, you guys not having church tonight? I'm like, oh. No, we have 10 o'clock Sunday morning. We still have two services. We just have them back to back. We just get it all done at one time. But, you know, it's, I mean, it's almost 4 o'clock, 3 o'clock, whatever it is. We've been here all day long. I said, okay. We start talking about him coming back. And then, of course, Alner, who's with him tonight, was with him Sunday. And he's looking at me. And he says, yeah, he said, I came here. He said, you laid hands on me. And I'm like, well, who, who'd you come here with? Because I'm not remembering. I know I'm taking a few minutes. I'm trying to help you live what I got to enjoy. I said, who'd you come with? 
He said, Brother Emmanuel. And I began to remember when Brother Emmanuel was first coming home. They have to go through transitional housing. Brother Alner was, was his manager. Who at one point told him, hey, sorry, program says you go to church over here. He said, no, I need to go to church over here. So Brother Alner and I had a little conversation, agreed to disagree, and we just leave it with God. And it was just a short time later, he called me back and said, you know what, as soon as we got off the phone, he said, I hit my knees. He said, God told me he comes to church there. So here we go, and all of a sudden, Reuben's out here on the parking lot. Reuben begins to tell me the whole story. He's been away from God. He's feeling the Spirit draw him, all the things he's trying to do. Alner's encouraging him, hey, this is the right thing to do. And he begins to tell me about his present relationship and that he shared with his girlfriend that, you know what, uh, I'm going back to church. But then he made a statement that I captured on. He said, but I told her, you know, I'm just going to take it easy. We talked, and all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost spoke to me, and I said, why are you going to take it easy? You're just going to have to jump back in. By this time, Brother Jason has come out. They saw each other, hollering each other. Brother Jason's over there, hugging necks, high-fiving, all excited. I'm cutting through the chase. I looked at Brother Reuben, and I said, it's time to come home. And I said, God's not interested in waiting until next week. Because they said, we're going to come back next week. I said, you won't come home because if so, I'm fixing to lay hands on you. I'm going to pray for you and the Holy Ghost is going to fall on you. And God's going to rebaptize you right here, right now in this parking lot. He said, amen. He threw his hands up. Brother Alner reached over and began to pray with him. Brother Jason began to pray. It was just a matter of minutes. And all of a sudden, Brother Reuben began to weep and cry and speak in other tongues as the Holy Ghost rebaptized. Church, I'm telling you, revival is upon us. This is our hour. God said he was going to bring them. He was going to draw them. We're going into the highways, the byways, and the hedges. But the Spirit is compelling with us. The Lord is in a rebuilding process. Let's rejoice tonight. A brother has come home. I said a brother has come home. Let there be a celebration voice in this house tonight. God is great and greatly to be praised. I'm sorry, I got, I got to touch it right now. It's just what I'm feeling where I'm at. I refuse to be the elder brother. That when the brother comes home from a far country, I want to sit back and say, well, how come he's getting all the attention? Brother Reuben, we celebrate you tonight. We celebrate your father. We celebrate the glory of God. Come on, somebody. Rejoice in Jesus Christ. Because this is just one of many, one of hundreds that God's going to bring. So we're excited about what God is doing in the spirit. We also tonight have to face the reality of things happening in the flesh and in life, transitions of life. I know that uh, the majority of you have already heard through the day via breeze, social media, phone calls. Uh, but um, Sister Jamie was unable to be in service last Wednesday. Uh, they took her to ER after service Wednesday. She went into the hospital, and as of uh, this morning, uh, they or yesterday afternoon, it was this morning. Finally, after a mini test, uh, the doctor came in and told them that uh, she has uh, cancer, very, very aggressive form of cancer, and that it is such a stage and point at this present time that they do not feel that chemotherapy, surgery, or any kind of uh, medical application would accomplish anything. And they have recommended for the family to put Sister Jamie into palliative care or hospice care. Um, the family is doing that, understanding that that's the medical hands that they're putting her in, but still saying, God, she belongs to you. You get the last say. So we're going to pray again tonight for Sister Jamie. 
We're going to pray tonight, and we're going to ask God to grant a miracle. We're going to pray for the family. But we also, we're going to trust God with what the Lord has allowed and whatever the Lord chooses to do. But tonight we put her in his hands. Sister Lydia Siemens got surgery in the morning at 11 o'clock. Actually, it'll be about 1 o'clock. Brother Fernando came through surgery today. Uh, They're on their way home. So would you lift your hands right now? and Let's go to the Lord in prayer. If you have a need in your own body, we invite you to come at this time. Lord God of heaven, we come before your throne. Lord God, we come in humility tonight. We come in transparency. Lord God, we don't understand your ways. We don't understand, God, we can't see your purpose. It's not, God, anything that we would have wanted to see allowed. But, Lord God, you control lives and you control destinies and you control the eternal. But, Lord God, we know, God, our sister's relationship with you, and we trust you with that tonight. Lord God, I pray tonight for Sister Jamie. Lord, I declare tonight from my heart, Lord, as a pastor representative of this house, Lord God, Lord, we ask you tonight to heal her body. We ask you tonight, oh God, to eradicate that cancer. Lord, we pray tonight that you, oh Lord God, if you can fit it into your divine plan and will for this hour, Lord God, that you would curse and reverse every rampant cell in her body. Lord God, that you would restore the pancreas and the liver, God, to health and life. Lord God, that you would allow her body to respond, God, regardless of what the doctors say. Lord God, and we will give you all the glory, all the honor, all the praise, Lord, for we would know without question that it was a miracle sent from heaven. But Lord God, we also tonight will choose to trust you with whatever it is that you determine to do. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory and the dominion, O Lord, forever and ever. Lord God, touch Sister Lydia in the morning. Keep your hand upon her. Continue healing God upon Brother Fernando. Keep your hand of mercy upon this congregation. Lord God, we give glory and honor and praise unto you. For whom have we in heaven but thee, O Lord God, to turn to in our hour of need. We love you, Jesus, and we praise your holy name. One more time, would you give the Lord a hand clap of praise? You would just remain standing, ask our ushers to come, want to receive our Wednesday tithe and offering. Do also, and I'm just going to give you a name. We're not going to pray at the moment, but I want you to pray for uh, Sybil Ashworth and her son, Paul Ashworth, and their family. This is a uh, gentleman that showed up here at the church yesterday, came in. His mother is 95 years old. Uh, She's at the end of life, and he said, uh, I'm not religious. He said, my mother was Pentecostal all of her life, and he said, I'm trying to find a Pentecostal preacher that will go see her and be willing to handle her service when she passes. I had the privilege today of going and spending one hour in a room with the tiniest, frailest, little white-haired 95-year-old lady who as we began to talk, she said, you're Pentecostal. I said, I'm Pentecostal. She said, well, I got the Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost. And I noticed that change in terminology. She said, when I was 20 years old, she said, speaking in tongues and all that stuff. She said, are you that kind of preacher? I said, yes, ma'am, I'm that kind of preacher. I said, do you know anything about Azusa Street? She said, oh, she said, I got to see it. She said, my daddy was a Pentecostal preacher. She looked down at the foot of the bed. She said, he's not religious. She said, but he went to church when he was a boy. He said, he sang in the choir. She said, I sure hope you can help him find his way. 
My point is simply this. I'm testifying to you again. God said he was going to send to us people with plates hungry. I didn't know Paul when he came in. Brother Spencer said, Pastor, there's a gentleman here who needs to talk to you. He later looked at me and he said, there's an open door. We just walked through the open door. Folks, be aware. Be a witness. Move. Act. Be kind. Love. Embrace people. And watch the Holy Ghost work. Brother Gabriel, would you ask the Lord's blessing on our giving? Amen. Lord bless you. you. May be seated as you're giving. Uh, very quickly, uh, by way of announcements, as the praise team gets ready to come back, I want to say thank you to this congregation. I will say this again on Sunday, but to all of you who chose to support our teenagers as they raised funds for Move the Missions, not just our teenagers, but even some of our younger children, uh, collectively, uh, your support, we gave an offering to move the mission of $3,299.97. That was part of a $450,000 record-breaking offering for the Western District, which became a part of a $8 million plus dollar record-breaking offer for the United Pentecostal Church International. Folks, it's beautiful when people choose to give to the kingdom of God. And I say to you, thank you for your sacrifice. One more time, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Just trying to remind you along the way this uh, Saturday, uh, 10 a.m. to 12 noon, new ministry called Treasured. It's for our young ladies, ages 10 to 16. Uh, we'll be in the gym led by Sister Cherish. So all of you that have young ladies in that age bracket, please feel free to bring them. That's what we want. And then this Sunday after service, uh, luncheon, thank you luncheon for our back to school bash. It will be open to everyone. We'll be in the gym immediately after our altar service. God bless you. Praise team. Would you come back and see if you can again bless these people? As, um, I don't want to talk forever, but as I was um, praying towards today's service and seeking God as to what he had for the service, I kept just kind of hearing the little whisper, you know, my name, my name, my name. And I was kind of like, okay, God, what do you, what do you want, what do you want to come from that, you know? And I kept feeling so strongly that there is somebody, maybe more than one somebody, but there is somebody in this place who you feel like there are walls on every side of you. You feel like the devil has blocked you in a corner. You can't go anywhere. You can't move forward anymore. You feel like all you can do is go backwards. But I want you to know today that God sees you. And you're not blocked in that corner. That God is reaching out his hand today and saying, come on, you're okay. But I want you to know that the situation, every wall, every bond can be broken just by the simple declaration of the name Jesus. A whisper, a shout, just saying Jesus. Whatever it may be, I want you to know that just proclaiming his name is all it takes. Atmosphere is changing, nothing stays the same. Heaven is waiting for the mention of the name. The spirit is moving, burning like a flame. Oh, healing the broken. By the one we proclaim 
raise it up, fill the sky. Chains will fall, mountains move, we lift him high. Speak the name, the name above all other names. Speak the name, the name the wind, the waves obey. All of heaven is coming down, fill the earth with the sound of the name, the name of Jesus. Gather all who wander, hostages of shame, miracles unfolding at the mention of a name. Our darkness is fleeing, mercy raining down, healing waters flowing as our lips make the sound. Raise it up, fill the sky, oh, chains will fall, mountains move, we lift him high. Speak the name, the name above all other names, speak the name, the name the wind and waves obey.
Ephesians 5 and 20. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want us right now to give God thanks for everything. Just let your mind go, let your spirit go, and for just a moment, I just want us to praise the name of Jesus and give thanks unto God. His goodness, His mercy, His salvation for truth, for revelation, for healing, for power, for dominion, for mercy, for grace, the sacrifice of Calvary. Come on, for everything that you can think of, just for a moment, for the very fact that He woke you up this morning. Gave you breath in your lungs, faculty of mind, strength in your limbs, the ability to be in this house. He's kept you all through the day. Come on, let let praise ascend unto the heavens. Glory be unto God by the power of the name of Jesus Christ. Let there be a certain sound that all attention and all focus is turned unto that name that is above every name. Glory be unto the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We praise you. We glorify you. We magnify you, O Lord. Glory be unto the name of Jesus. Shout the name of Jesus. Shout it again. Shout it again. I want hell to hear it tonight. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. There's power. There's glory. There's victory. There's deliverance. There's hope. There's help. There's strength. In the name of Jesus. We give thanks unto God in all things. got to move with what the Spirit's prompting me at the moment. Acts 16 and 18. Brother Matt, can you turn me up just a little bit on the monitors? I know I'm good out there. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he, that spirit, came out the same hour. In the name of Jesus tonight, I take dominion and authority over every dark spirit that is tormenting every soul in this building. And in the name of Jesus Christ, I dispossess your position. I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to remove yourself, remove your stronghold, and you will depart and let liberty of the Holy Ghost that is found in the name of Jesus reign through this sanctuary. Somebody right now, I'm telling you, I don't care how bound you felt. I don't care how tormented you have felt. Lift your hands, lift your heart, and say, God, I will embrace the liberty of the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus Christ. Just shout the name of Jesus. Speak the name of Jesus. Speak it like you believe it. Speak it like you know it. Speak it like you know and your hope and authority is in that name. In the name of Jesus. Speak unto the mountain till it be removed and cast into the sea. Scripture says in his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yea, the faith 
which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. He was saying, you're, you're, you're witnessing a miracle. Because you know what the mess looked like. You know what the brokenness looked like. But you're seeing the miracle. And he said, I just want to make sure everybody understands that the miracle has happened through the power and authority of the name of Jesus Christ. Say, Pastor, what does that mean? God is no respecter of persons. If he can give strength and miracle in that situation through the power of his name, then you understand I'm going to speak the name of Jesus in this room. We sang the name of Jesus in this room. If you've come tonight weak, if you've come tonight weary, if you've come tonight needing strength, I'm telling you, lift up your hands right now and say, Lord God, that strength is still flowing all the way from Calvary. It's still connected to the name of Jesus. And Lord, I'm going to receive it into my body. I'm going to receive it into my spirit. I came in weary. I came in worn I came in tired but oh Lord God of heaven I receive your strength in the name of Jesus there's just something That happens when you move beyond conscious thought of his word. And you choose regardless of thought to believe in his word. Because you are never going to fully wrap your mind around God and his power and the realm of the spirit. But you wrap as much as you can. You embrace as much as you can. You learn as much as you can. But then with whatever gaps are there, you just say, I choose to trust and I choose to believe. And he said that all power in heaven and in earth is given into that name. At the mention of that name, the devils himself are fearful and begin to tremble. He said through that name and through his sacrifice on Calvary that there is healing, there is redemption, there is power, there is strength, there is renewal. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Somebody tonight, choose to believe. Come up out of your darkness. Come up out of the pit and embrace Him. I don't understand all God said. That's the appetizer. Do you understand your whole world can change right here tonight? Right here, right now, whatever you're dealing with, wrestling with, fighting with, it can change right here, right now. I wish it was because you were here. Brother Terry, it would be so awesome for you to have that power. But you're just like me. We're just two broken people. And broken things can't fix people. But I know one tonight that's not broken. He was broken. He was bruised. He was battered. He was scarred. He was humiliated. But he had so much power that even when they saw him physically die and put him in a tomb, he just went down to the belly of hell for three days. And I'm going to make it figurative for you. He looked at the enemy and said, I need the keys. I need the keys. I let you mess with them for a while. You've locked up a lot of people. You've given people no hope. You've told them you control. I just need the keys because guess what? I walked in here and I'm walking out of here. 
And when I walk out, I'm getting up on the third day and I'm rising victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And I am going to speak life in the face of death. I'm going to speak hope when people are hopeless. I'm going to speak power when people are powerless. And all they that do call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He said, I don't care what their situation is. When they began to call on me, he said, I'm going to save them out of the trouble. I'm going to redeem Come on, somebody. There's hope in the house. There's power in the house. There's renewal in this house. There's just something about presenting you to him. Turning you over to him. And that's what I want to talk to you about tonight. If I can direct you, I'm going to follow the Holy Ghost here, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to relax a little bit, and I'm just going to try to teach for a minute. Is that okay to kind of ride that wave tonight? But I, I do have to tell you, I got a fire burning, so you be careful how you respond to my teaching. Because I'm already in a treaching mood. Genesis chapter 8, verse number 20. I'm just going to read the first portion. Would you have it or see it on the screen? Would you say amen? amen. That was half of you, so I'll give the other half a chance to catch up. When you have it or you see it, would you say amen? amen. I don't know if you really saw it or not. You just want me to move on, but that's okay. Genesis 8 and 20, the first portion. And Noah builded an altar unto the Lord. I want to teach tonight a very simple title, Altars and Prayer. Altars and Prayer, you may be seated. The altar... In its simplest definition, you'll probably find another one, but this one's mine. Simplest definition, considering what I would say multiple different shades of expression, is a place of sacrifice or worship. When you begin to talk about an altar, we're going to start in the Old Testament. And you begin to talk about altars being built as they relate to God. And even, we could go so far as even unto idols. They were built and constructed. They were places where things were offered on those altars as a form of sacrifice and or worship unto the deity for us and for Old Testament believers in Jehovah God Almighty it was sacrifices of worship unto him for his mercy and goodness in their life it's a form of recognition that are you ready this is always a wake up call Okay, he's God and I'm not So there's really no need for me to go stand in front of the mirror and worship myself. There, I didn't say, and work on yourself. We all need to work on ourselves in front of the mirror. We just don't worship ourselves. There's no need for any one of us to worship each other. Because not any one of us are God or a God. So when people would begin to worship him, it was with the understanding that there is a God, and I'm going to speak particularly to the Jewish people for a little bit, and relating to them, but that there, there is a God, Jehovah, he's our God, he is the only God, he is the mighty God, 
He is the God from the beginning. He's the God here in the middle of our life, and He will be the God at the ending. He is a God of commandment. He's a God of law. He has given us a law to follow, and a part of that law tells us that we will offer sacrifice of worship unto Him. And because He's God, and we're not, we are going to religiously and ritually Offer sacrifice to Him. Not in the way that we would like it to be done. Not in the way that we think would be better or more productive or easier or quicker or more pleasant. Because when you read the Old Testament sacrifices, and again, please, they were a very gruesome process. Because according to God's commandment for that sacrifice to take place. Well, there's a lot of different sacrifices, and I'll touch on those as I go forward in a minute. But the main sacrifice was, again, a burnt offering that required an animal to be sacrificed. Its blood had to be spilled, and I'm not going to go into all the details. But it, it was not a, a pretty sight, if you please. But it was what God commanded. God is a God of precedence. God is a God of order. He is a God that changes not. So while He may change particular, if we can say it that way, as He transitions through time and dispensations, and in the New Testament there is different type of sacrifice to be offered, and we'll talk about that in a moment, there is still the type and shadow that comes that says what God orders is what we do. And nothing else accomplishes pleasing sacrifice or worship unto Him. Let me just kind of walk here. In the Old Testament, the altar was a place of physical construction upon which a sacrifice was burned or offered. Again, different types of sacrifices, but this is the main. It was the pattern that was established and practiced in their time by both the Jews and by pagans. They just worshipped different gods. When you look at, how many of you remember a guy called uh, Abraham? Wait, one, two, three, five. Oh, okay, all right, all right. Everybody's participating. Now, all of a sudden, I thought, Lord, have mercy. Okay, let's go back to Sunday school. And we'll start over. Abraham, the father of the faith. A great patriarch of the Old Testament. Great inspiration to us. Let's look at Romans 4.16. Therefore, it is a faith, that it might be by grace, to the end the promise might be sure to all seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. This is where that phrase, father of the faithful, comes. Abraham's faith in God, trust in God, allow God cause God to give a promise into his life to which he obeyed. We're going to talk about that in just a second. But again, we're going to discover something about Abraham when he realizes that I have relationship with God. Let's look at this. Genesis chapter 12, verses 6 and 7. We're just going to walk quickly here, but it's, it's a synopsis, a summary of the journey of Abraham. Abram, which was his name, when God called him, became later Abraham. Abram passed through the land unto the place of Shechem, unto the plain of Morah, and the Canaanite was then in the land. Okay, let's keep going. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. The Lord is telling him, There is a land, there is a place, it's here. I'm going to give this to you. It doesn't belong to you right now, but I'm going to give it to you. You have to understand, at this moment, Abraham has a choice to make. Either he's going to believe that that enemy is greater than the God that's making the promise of conquering. And he's going to say, you know what, I think I'm going home. 
Or he's going to choose to believe that God and his word and God's power has the ability to dispossess that enemy from the land. And give him the promises that God has made to him. He says, I'm going to give it to you and to your seed. And there, watch this, and there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. This is what is called in theology the altar of promise. Abraham is teaching us a principle. It's something we learn from. Instead of just taking a promise and running to embrace it, Abraham says this is a place to worship the Lord. Bear with me. I don't have the land yet. I just have the promise. But it's still the place and the time to worship because God just did something for me. Oh, wait, but God didn't do it. Oh, yes, He did. He gave me His word that I have a future different than where I'm standing right now. I have God's word that he's taking me somewhere different than where I am now. And instead of waiting until I get where I'm going, I am going to worship him here and now. Let me tell you, folks, it's not enough to just shout when the battle's over. But when you get a word from God that victory's on its way, when you get a word from God that I'm moving you forward, that's the place to build an altar of worship under the Lord. It's an altar of promise and we rejoice it. Keep moving. Just want you to see a pattern for verse 8. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent having Bethel on the west and Ai and that's not Ai like we know on the east Boy, AI is older than we thought, isn't it? And I didn't even know that. Oh, I'm glad some of you are smiling right now. And there, there he built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. He thanked God for his promise and then he started on the journey. The next place he stops, he builds another altar. And it's an altar unto the Lord, and it's what's called an altar of praise. He, sh- he says, I got a promise. I'm going to build an altar of worship. I'm going to recognize that God gave me a word. But now I'm on my journey, and He's keeping me on my journey. So you know what? I'm going to build an altar, and I'm going to offer praise unto Him. That's why, again, coming from the south, they used to sing the song. He woke me up this morning, started me on my way, guides me on my journey, keeps me day by day. Folks, I'm here. There's just something about waking up and understanding. You know what? He woke me up this morning, started me on my way. I'm going to build an altar and praise Him through the day. Come on, I wish somebody tonight would make up your mind that I'm going to be an altar builder. Oh, Lord, help me, Jesus. I feel some wild stuff coming on. Grab the reins, pull them down tight. Genesis 13, 14 through 18. Now remember, this is the father of the faithful. How many of you want to be faithful? How many of you want to live out your spiritual genealogy? You want your spiritual DNA to be produced in your life. Are you ready for this? You're going, oh, but I just can't be faithful. Yes, you can. It's in you. You are the children of Abraham. It's in you. I'm going to say it again. It is in you if you want to develop it. And Abraham, by the direction of God, is showing us how to do it. Altars build faithfulness. He said, I'm taking no part of my journey for granted. Altar building was a priority for Abraham. Are you ready? Faithful people are 
faithful altar builder. I, I, I don't want to make too much of, don't want to make too little, don't want to hurt anybody's traditional mindsets. This is an altar in present culture. It is that physical thing that was built to offer things on. Okay? But the altar of relationship is not the place. It is what happens at the place. Okay? We'll come back to that. So, I don't want you to get focused on the fact that if I say faithful people are people of altars, that that means that what makes you faithful is getting up off that pew and coming down here and standing around this front. Guess what you did? You got up off the pew and you came down around the front. Because I've seen people come and stand around the front and never build an altar. But I've also seen people never come down to the front and build an altar standing all through the building. Because they engage God in relationship. Okay? And that's what the altar is all about. There is some value, and it marks its part of our, our spiritual culture in Western civilization. Of coming to, or they used to call it the kneeling bench, the altar. There, there, there is a value, too. When it's time to make a commitment to God and there's a call for a commitment, an altar call if you please. There is a value within the framework of the mind itself of stepping out of the pew and saying I am going forward publicly identifying myself in front of everybody that I'm going to make a commitment to God. But just because I walked down here doesn't mean I made a commitment. And are you ready? Just because you don't come doesn't mean you didn't make a commitment. Not making sense. All right. So again, Genesis 13, 14 through 18. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot was separated from him, we're not going to go through all that history, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward. Make it simple for us so we don't get confused. He said, look north, south, east, and west. I want you to look in every direction. For all the land which thou seest, the Lord is enlarging Abraham's vision. You, you, you got to get a picture. He said, I want you to look north. How far can I see to the north? Look to the east. I, again, forgive me. I don't know north, south, east, and west. So if I'm looking in the wrong direction, I'm making the illustration here, but not physically. Can somebody tell me which way is north? That way. All right. Okay, I, I got this. Look to the north. As far as you can see. Watch this. I, I'm, I'm smarter than I look. Look to the east. As far as you can see. Look to the south as far as you can see. Look to the west as far as you can see. Thank you guys for helping the directionally challenged. You got to get, he didn't tell him just look to the north and all the land you see. He said, I want you to look 360 degrees. He said, because I'm not a God of small things, I'm a God of greatness. Abraham, you are my seed. And out of my seed and your seed, we're going to build a kingdom and a nation that's going to take the world. So you look as far as you can see in every direction and you need to understand the God that you're following and the God that you're worshiping. I'm going to give you everything you see. It all belongs to you. I don't have time to go into this. Search history. Search his roots. And see what God gave. Look at the impact of the seed of Abraham upon the world. You will find God's greatness performing what he promised. I know I'm, I know I'm going slow. 
He said, I'm going to give it and to thy seed forever. It was not just a physical promise. But it was a spiritual promise because Abraham was not just a father of an earthly nation, but he was the father of the faithful, which is a spiritual nation. The Bible calls us the sons and daughters of Abraham. So God was telling us, when you begin to view what I can do for you, he said, don't just be one directional. He said, I want you looking everywhere at everything because there is nothing that I cannot give to you if I choose to give it to you. Once you get that in your mind and then you begin to hear the promises of God, you begin to realize if he can give me everything, then when he tells me he's going to give me something, that ain't nothing at all. But if he says he's going to give me something, I'm going to embrace that until he gives me everything. And I'm going to walk in faith and belief because my God is a God that promises great things. I gotta hurry. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that a man can, so that if, if, notice, if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. He said, Abraham, I'm, I'm just putting the big if there, because Abraham, you're smart enough knowing nobody can count the dust of the earth. He said, What I'm gonna do with you in multiplying you and your seed for the glory of my name, he said, it's gonna be something that no man can number. Sorry, forgive me. Go all the way to the book of Revelation. John the Revelator writing. He said, and I saw a number that no man could number. It was just innumerable. Why? Because that's the greatness of God. That is the promise of Abraham. All right, keep reading. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Verse 18, watch this. Then Abram removed his tent, came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and did what? Built there an altar unto the Lord. This is called, as you read, the altar of peace. He's now at peace. In the beginning, he just saw something that God could do and started walking. The further he walked, the greater the vision got. Until now, he's at a place of peace because he understands, man, I got a home. I got a future. Well, who I am, it's just going to get greater. It's going to get bigger. My, my heart is at peace because I know my God and everything's going to be all right. Now, obviously, he had some bumps along the way, but again, he's building altars, building altars, building altars. Genesis 22, 9 through 14. And they came to the place which God told him of. All right, now listen. He didn't get to the place that God told him of by trying to go someplace God didn't tell him to go. Now, I know that's revelatory. But, you know, if I tell you to go to, is it, is it DK's Donuts? If I tell you to go to DK's Donuts... And you end up at Slow Doco. You didn't follow my instructions. Now I know you may think that, you know, well, I like Slow Doco better. Well, if I'm the one that's telling you where you need to go get the donuts that are the key to your promise, you don't want to show up at somebody else's donut shop. Making sense. All oh, you're going, man, I want a donut right now. So he got where God told him to go by going where God told him to go. Sometimes we wonder. Well, God made me this promise. And now I come out did you go where he told you to go? Did you do what he told you to do? Or did you just do part of it and then did the rest of the way? You're trying, to, you're trying to get there by your own path. When you don't go the direction God tells you to go, when you don't do what God told you to do, don't expect to get what God told you you were going to receive. And it's only through the product of an altar that you are finding yourself taking time to mark the moments and the steps and you're honoring God that I'm in the path, I'm on the way, I'm obeying, I fully expect to receive all right, let's keep reading. I 
got to hurry. Abraham built an, he built an altar there too. What is this guy doing? He's just building altars. He's worshiping God. He's in relationship with God. God's telling him things. God's promising him stuff. And so every time he's able to recognize that I'm on my way, God provided. God gave me a promise. God gave me peace. I, I'm not waiting to get all the way to the end. I'm just going to build altars all along the way because this isn't about, this really isn't about the promise. This is about the promise giver. This is about the promise speaker. This is about the promise provider. This is about the one who's going to make it happen. And if I just stay in relationship with him, him all along the way and keep giving him glory and keep giving him honor and he keeps being pleased with my worship unto him then he's just going to keep on doing exactly what he said he would do I'm telling somebody anchor yourself via an altar quit listening to other people quit getting distracted by other people keep your eyes on Jesus Christ keep worshiping him keep building altars every step of the way We got so far to go. Lord, help these poor people. So he's building his altars. Watch this. He's building his altars not to get God to do something. Stay with me. See, because somehow we, we've equated in, in the church that if I come and make this sacrifice for God, then I, then I got credit with God and I can force God to do what I want him to do. No, Abraham says you got it backwards. You read God's word. You hear God's word. You respond to God's word. And when you recognize that you got God's word, then you go to the altar and you build an altar and you worship him and you praise him. And as you're going and the obedience produces something in your life, you, you, don't, you, you praise him and you worship him for that. And when he gives you peace, you know, you're going to make it. You, you give him praise and worship for that. You are responding. Your altars are not built as a point of begging God. They're built as a point and a place of relationship and honor and thanksgiving. Because you know what, God? You're worthy to be praised. You're worthy to be exalted. Because you know what, God? I heard a word and I chose to believe it. And Lord God, I know you're going to do it because I hear the testimony of the past. So I'm going to add my worship and my altar into that. And I'm going to praise you in the moment. Folks, let's get past this point, And I'm going to be a little blunt here. Of sadistic religion. Where we are always looking to make some kind of sacrifice unto God under the pretense and ideology that if I make this sacrifice, then I'm going to get God to do something. Do you understand God wants to bless you? God wants to do something for you? And are you open? He already has. He gave you His Word. He gave you His promises. He gave you the hope of His power. He gave you the hope of your sins being washed away. He said your family can be filled. Your life can be blessed. Folks, we don't have to try to get God to do anything. He already gave it to us. What we've got to do now is say, you know what? I'm going to praise you for your Word. I'm going to praise you for your promise. And as I embrace that Word and began to live it, And all of a sudden, I read it. He did it. He did it. My next altar is not a self-chosen altar of sacrifice to try to get God to do something else. It is literally to live in an act of worship unto Him. It says, you know, He's promised me. He, he's, not, he's not a liar. He's going to fulfill so I'm just going to praise him for what he's already done. 
because I already know he's going to do something else. And so I'm just going to praise him for what he's already done. I'm going to embrace him, rejoice in him, and I'm going to wake up in the morning and say, this is the day that the Lord hath made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. Why? Because I know who holds the day and the morrow, and he's a good God, and every good and perfect gift cometh down from the Father above. He desires to bless me. He desires to anoint me. He's not out to destroy me. I gotta, I gotta hurry. There was a whole lot more here than I realized. When you go through the Old Testament, man, if I can ever get to the New Testament, we can get done tonight. You can read through on your own. Isaac, Jacob, Moses, the children of Israel as a nation, Joshua, Manoah, Samuel, Saul, David, just to name a few. They all built altars of worship unto the Lord. It was a pattern. It was a part of Old Testament worship. All the altars were places that signified sacrifice or worship to Jehovah as a testimony. You buckled up. Of his relationship with them. I want to tell you why I said it that way. Because if he doesn't choose to have a relationship with you, you have no relationship. Okay, we're going back to level 101 when I started. Because he's God and you're not. He chooses. But oh, the beauty. It's a reason to build an altar. Somebody said the cross. Somebody said Calvary. Somebody said God left the portals of glory, robed himself in flesh, came down to earth as a common man, lived, suffered, died, bled for me. For me, died for my sin. And rose again on the third day victorious while I have lived defeated. And you tell me I'm supposed to be some somber somebody off in a corner and taking a, a, a cat of nine tails and beating my back continually every day because somehow I'm going to convince him to love me. Folks, I don't have to convince him to love me. He already proved he loved me. The Bible says that he loved us while we were yet sinners and that he died for us. I need somebody to understand here that he does. He wants you to grow unto perfection, but you'll never be to perfection until the second coming of the Lord. Get over that idea that somehow if I ever get perfect, I can make it. Folks, you have all the perfection you need. You have the power of Jesus Christ. You have the power of the Holy Ghost. Because when you try to prove your own perfection, all you do is reveal your imperfection. But when you accept the fact, Brother Jason, you taught an incredible lesson this past Sunday, and you're going to teach part two Sunday. The war within. But when you realize that what I have to fight for is my relationship with Him. I got to hold on to Him. How do I hold on to Him? I hold on to Him with altars of worship and praise and obedience to His Word. And He's going to take care of everything else. Because if I'm falling short, He's still way above. If I'm down, He still lifts me up. If I feel like I can't make it, He is more than enough. Come on, somebody. He's more than enough. He is my keeper. He is my anchor. He is my rock. When you try on your own, you will reveal to yourself, to the whole world, your imperfection. Because I love you, but you're not that good. You're just not that strong. You're just not that capable. You may become a better person, but you'll never be the person it's full of power and glory because God's glory and power lives through our imperfections. Yeah. I hope I'm not messing anybody's theology up here tonight. So let me fast forward. All through the Old Testament, you can track the building of altars. Then you launch over into the New Testament. And you don't find the building of those physical altars anymore. seems like where'd, where'd they go obviously altars are mentioned 
some 21 times in the, so that they're mentioned. As you go through them, you find they're making reference to Old Testament under the law, the process, the way of the Jews, m making a spiritual type. Or, amazingly enough, let's read Matthew 5, 23, 24. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there remembers that thy brother hath ought against thee, verse 24, leave there thy gift before the altar, go thy way, first be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. God now is moving into New Testament where he says an altar revolves not just around relationship between a man and God, but between men and men. He said, up until now you lived under the law that let you just communicate direct with me and me with you. You didn't have to have any concern for your brothers. He said, but now... He said, if you're going to have an altar and you're going to offer a gift unto me, and you're going to worship me. He said, you got, listen to me. He said, you got to first be concerned about your brother if you want me to be concerned about you. That's, that's, that's pretty heavy stuff. It's another lesson all on its own, but has anybody in here ever had a hard time with your brothers or your sisters? Hey, come on, we're all, let's all be honest. Everybody raise your hand together. That way nobody. Everybody has it sometime or another. And isn't it so amazing that you know, we can come in here hating each other, but we can just go into a relationship with God? God said, no. He said, because the brother or the sister sitting next to you, in front of you, behind you, he said, I died for them. They are just as valuable as you are. And he said, your valuation of your brothers and your sisters, your willingness to forgive, to strengthen, to help, to help them find relationship with me is so important. He said that I, I, you, you, you can come up here all you want to. You can shout all you want to about, man, me and God, we're doing our thing. He said, you make a lot of noise, but ain't nothing happening. Because the altar is changing a dynamic because it's moved from physical to spiritual. It's moved into a spiritual relationship. I, I got to hurry. Not for you, just for me. Jesus did away with the ritual of the altar when he became the lamb slain before the foundation earth, when he became the sacrifice for all of humanity. He became that sacrifice. He became sin, the scripture says, for us. Don't have time to go into all this. Let's, let's, let's read Hebrews 9, 12 through 15. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered into once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So he said all that part in the Old Testament of the sins being rolled ahead, he said, you know what, I'm just going to sum it all up. He said, I'm going to become your sacrifice. I'm going to go die in your place. I'm going to become the sacrifice for you. He said, I'm going to take care of the physical death, he said, so that you can have spiritual life. And then we're going to move into the New Testament, he said, where the altar is going to take on a little bit different tone as it relates to you. And this is what I've taught to get to here tonight. Again, and I, let me just tell you, Luke 24 and 49. In Jesus Christ, he became again our sacrifice for sin so that we could worship him. Are you right? Through the place of prayer, prayer becomes our altar space. It's not a physical place and a physical death anymore. It is a spiritual place. Prayer becomes the place of communion and worship and talking with God. God says it doesn't just have to be after I have done something for you. He said, but now the altar is expanded. It can be a place where you bring your petitions. You bring your requests. You bring everything that you have in your, or you're offering all yourself. Stay with me. Luke 24, 49. He told them there was a promise. He said, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem till you be endued with power from on high. Acts 2.17. And I haven't come to preach about the baptism of the Holy Ghost, but we're going to touch it as we go. 
And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. This is a part of a promise and a fulfillment. This is the spiritual promise and fulfillment. What? Joel 2.28. We're going to jump back to the Old Testament. See, and it shall come to pass afterward. I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Old Testament was promised. New Testament's coming. They're saying this is what's happening. Acts 2, 38 and 39. Then Peter said unto them, Repent, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of sins. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The promise is coming down. It's being revealed. The promise is unto you. Remember with Abraham, the promise is unto you. It's to your children, to your seed, to all those that are far off. We're seeing the spiritual fulfillment. The promise is unto you, to your children, to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. The Bible says he's called all men unto repentance. So the promise of Abraham and the spiritual promise associated with Abraham is one that applies to every man, every woman, every boy, every girl. It's to all of us. But again, remember, Abraham built altars to capture the promise to hold on to the promise, to protect the promise, and to experience the fullness of the promise. So for us as a church, Brother Shavaria, Brother Mike Shavaria, last week you so moved in the Holy Ghost. Powerful move of the Holy Ghost. Talking about the need to hold on to prayer. What I'm driving at here tonight, and I'm making a quick hinge, is I want us to get beyond the idea that the altar is just a few minutes up here around the front of this church. And that our altars are to either plead with God to have mercy on us, although they are, or they're a place that hopefully we can find the right words to try to manipulate God into doing what we want Him to do for us. The altar and prayers are all about worshiping him for the promise of his word, his ability to produce it, and for us worshiping and praising him as we see him doing that. If it's forgiveness of our sins, we praise him for forgiveness. I want, I want some of you to get out of condemnation. I want you to get over beating yourself up and feeling like and forgive you're having to flog yourself day by day by day to somehow please God. Do you understand He loves you? He's not wanting you to afflict yourself. He's your father. Listen, He's a good father. He will correct you if you need correction. You don't have to spend your whole life trying to be your own father. Telling yourself how bad you are, how poor you are, how much you messed up and everything that's wrong and you know better than you got. If God wants you to know that, or you're, he already told you in his word. But mixed in with his word is his promise. Mixed in with his word is the cure for your failure. Mixed in with his word is the promise of strength for your weakness. And because I know that's in his word and I read it in the morning, I, instead of beating myself up for my failures yesterday, I can say, thank God you became the sacrifice for my sin. The blood has been applied and I will rise up today and I will walk in the power and the glory of the promises of God. And devil, you will not defeat me because you're not my father and you don't have the final say so and the Lord has already spoken that all they that do trust in the name of the Lord the same shall be saved so you know what I'm going to make it God's going to keep me God's going to hold me I am going to have an altar relationship with God through my prayer all right we'll let you stand so that you have hope
I found myself with all of this coming down to the point of, okay, but God, I know you were the lamb slain before the foundation of the earth. I get, I get all of that. You became the ultimate sacrifice for sin. But in the Old Testament, with the altars, these people had an engagement with an altar and a sacrifice. Now, obviously, we have a sacrifice in the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want to read a couple more scriptures to you because the Lord let me understand that while he is the sacrifice for sin, are you, are you ready? We become the sacrifice of obedience. One of the sacrifices in the Old Testament was called the sacrifice of reparation. In other words, you, you are paying back. This was one form of worship and of a sacrifice. He fit the burnt offering, the beast, the animal. But these other areas of sacrifice, this one called reparation just leapt out at me. And I found myself, so let's, let's read it, and we can make a way to the end. Romans 12 and 1. Can you find that one, Brother Bird? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, sacrifice, or worship. So every day I get up. Are you ready? I'm, I'm just not. If any man would come after me. You want to help me? Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. What did the Apostle Paul say? say? He said, I die daily. What was he saying? He was saying, in the spirit realm, there's still an act of sacrifice. And something that I can offer to him. Because he offered himself for me. But I'm going to be an altar builder. So I'm going to choose to die daily. What is the sacrifice? It's simple. It's self. It's me. So every day I get up and I present my body a living sacrifice. holy, acceptable unto God. It's my reasonable worship. It's just what's right. It's what's honorable. And I'm doing it not to try to get him to love me. I'm doing it because of what he's already done for me. All of a sudden, it's not a heavy burden to bear. It's just what makes sense. He loved me. I love him. Believe it or not, and I'm closing. Scripture says, I'm not even going to read. It says that if you love me, anybody know? Keep my commandments. He went on to say, if a man love me, he will keep my commandments. Folks, what I'm trying to tell you, get over trying to get, or hear me, trying to get him to love you by keeping commandments. Worship him. And reflect your love to him by keeping. What's his commandments? It's his word. Whatever you see in his word, whatever he reveals in his word, however it plays out in you, just do it. Why? Because Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. He, I am weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, 
Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. I'm going to end here. If you ever grew up around church, maybe you didn't, but even as a kid, and somebody sang that song to you, even though you didn't really know God then, do you remember how it felt to sing that song? It, it was just like, Jesus, he's big up there. I'm little down here. <laughs> he loves, big him loves little me. And we would smile. We would be so happy singing that little song. What's the difference between now and then? Then we did not yet know the weight of our own sins. Now we do. Then we didn't have all the failures. We didn't understand all. Now we do. But can I tell you a secret? His love has never so strong right now. You, under, you can't sin enough that God doesn't love you. You can't fall hard enough that God doesn't love you. His love is pure. It's undefiled. It's rich. It's free. It was with his understanding that you would fall, you would make a mistake, that he said, I'm going to the cross. I'm going to become that sacrifice so that when you fall, Amen. you can build an altar of worship that says, I can be forgiven because he already became my sacrifice. Oh, Lord, somebody just lift your hands for a moment all over the building. I know I've gone a little bit long here tonight, but the Holy Ghost is in this house. Jesus is trying to remind somebody, you don't have to pick yourself up. He will pick you up. You just need to keep doing everything you know to do. You just need to come back and say, I'm going to build another altar. Life may have torn it down. I may have kicked it down. But God, you died for me. You shed your blood for me. You said, you, oh Lord God, would wash me, cleanse me, fill me, forgive me, and save me. So God, I'm going to praise you for that. I'm not going to beat myself up over my failures but I will say thank God I can be forgiven. Thank God I can get up again. Thank God I can still make it. Thank God he still lives. Thank God it's not over yet. Rejoice not against me oh my enemy. I may have fallen but hey enemy I'm getting up through the power of the name of Jesus Christ. Altars and prayer go together. I said it last Wednesday, and this is where I end. The Lord has commanded us, and we have done so, to lengthen the cords, enlarge the borders of our tent. We're stretching, we're reaching like we have never done. But he said, when you're doing that, you deepen the stakes. He said, if the house is going to hold everything that I'm telling you to stretch for, he said, then those cords of reaching have to be anchored by deeper stakes. So let it be our commitment tonight, individually and collectively, if we're going to stretch and reach and grow, and we are, as God commanded then our altar experiences here in the pews, at home, by the bedside, closets of prayer, recliners and rockers, sitting on the beach, wherever you're praying. It's not just going to be a time of daily ritual. I'm running stakes of worship down deep. Deep in faith, deep in commitment. 
deep in expectancy, deep in knowing that my Redeemer liveth and everything that he said would come to pass. I'm looking north, south, east, and west. I'm expecting a great, great harvest from God, but I'm going to run the stakes so deep in my life. We're going to run them so deep as a church. It won't matter what wind blows. It doesn't matter what storm comes. We'll be anchored through our faith in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you lift your hands right now? Would you thank him tonight? Would you let there just be a momentary altar of worship, a prayer, an utterance from your lips, but that comes from the depths of your soul? It says, Lord God, you have done marvelous things. Lord, you have made promises, and I can testify tonight, oh God, you have kept so many and performed so many already. But Lord God of heaven, I know that you're a provider. And Lord God, I'm rejoicing in those, and I'm just walking forward. Lord God, I'm just moving forward in you, moving forward in church attendance, moving forward in obedience, moving forward, God, in commitment of my life, my lifestyle, however you lead me from your word. I'm not going to question it because I know where it's leading me. I know where it's taking me. I'm not going down a dead end road. I'm going to a heavenly home. I'm going to an eternal destination. I'm going to be a light on a hillside I'm going to be a light in the darkness around me I'm going to be a world changer I'm going to be a life changer because God that's what you promised me I would become in you I am God a minister of the gospel and I'm going to let it live and let that light shine and God I'm going to worship you and praise you every single day all along the way I'm doing what the Lord has told me. He said, you've talked about the altar. You've talked about prayer. But do not give an altar call. I want them to take this, and I want them to go home. And I want them to process it in their personal prayer and in their personal life. And let that word settle down. Because it will produce, hear me, personal altars as opposed to a community collective altar moment. So go home with this. If you want to try to take scripture by scripture, expand on the study, that's fine. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you that that's not the fullness of God's will. I want you to take the spirit of what I've ministered. I want you to take it home. And between now and Sunday, run the stakes down deep. Begin to live in the power. And you know what? He deserves all the glory, all the honor, all the praise. He alone is worthy. Would you lift your hands and love him one more time and dismiss him? Lord God, we lift our voices unto you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the ministry of your spirit. Lord God, I've not tried to underspeak it tonight or overspeak it. Lord God, I didn't just try to say something to be heard. Lord, I've done my best to follow the diligence and direction of your spirit. I pray tonight, let your word, God, take root. Let it, God, fall on good ground. Lord God, I pray, let it settle down deep, God, and let the roots go deep. Lord, while you make us a greater people, while you multiply us numerically, I simply pray, God, help us to be more spiritual people. Help us to be people of deeper prayer and more dedicated lives. Lord, our lives are in your hands. We give you glory and honor and praise in the name of Jesus. And everybody say amen. amen. Lord bless you. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.